Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see we've got a little bit smaller crowd than normal here oh, today. <coughs> Some people not here. here. So, uh, we can get started this morning. And uh, I decided on Acts 24, 22 through 25 this morning, talking about, uh, Ryan's going to be talking about self-control this morning. And Paul talks a little bit about this uh, to someone here in, in, in the Bible. And it's a long reading, so bear with me. It says, Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and his, permit his friends to come and care for his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the, at the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, and so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. We can see here that one of the main things that Paul talked about when he talked about the good news, the gospel of Christ, you know, righteousness. One of the main things I talked about was self-control. Just think about when you're talking to someone who was in charge like Felix was, and he had commanders under him and things like that, and you start talking to someone like that about self-control, that would scare them a little bit because you could see that. And we could see our own world that way. When you think about um, Christ and you think about trying to live a Christian life, it is about self-control. Putting yourself last, putting others first. The things that we would normally do uh, sometimes isn't the right thing to do. And sometimes uh, uh, we need to have that self-control. And here Felix, he even says, that's enough. I don't want to really hear that from him. And But he continually calls for him and talks to him, uh, talks to Paul. And it's important that we, we see that. Paul was talking about how important it is to have yourself under control as a Christian in California. <clears throat> so this morning I thought uh, we'd uh, sing some songs and the way to be as much, get ourselves out of it and be self-controlled is to get ourselves as much as close as we can and be like Jesus. Talk about someone who was had no self. It was all about others, helping others, making sure others around him was taken care of, and then ultimately dying for everyone and sacrificing himself for everyone in the whole world. <clears throat> the first song is going to be Kneel at the Cross, and then after this song, uh, Gary will lead us in a opening prayer. <clears throat> Kneel at the cross, Christ will meet you there, he intercedes for you. Your voice, leave within your care, and begin life anew. Kneel at the cross, leave every care. Kneel at the cross, Jesus will be. Who are anchored there? Near 
paradigm place. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace and mercy once again this morning, thanking you again for another day of life and, and allowing us, Father, to come and worship you here in this small place. And we are just so thankful that we, that we can come together as brothers and sisters in Christ and be able to tell you how much we love you because you showed us how to love through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus, for going to that cross. For, for doing that, we, are going to, we have the opportunity of being saved. And we look forward to the day when faith shall be sight, and we will be able to be with all the other saints in heaven. Again, thank you, Jesus. We would be totally lost if this great gift had not been given to us, and that you willingly went to that terrible, terrible cross. We ask now, Father, that as we uh, continue in our worship service here, that you will be with us, and we pray, Father, that we would be uh, attentive to the songs that we are singing and, of course, to what Brother Ryan is going to bring to us this morning. We ask now, Father, you continue to bless each and every one of us. Forgive us of our sins. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. <clears throat> My next song is Follow Me. And in this song, um, at the start of it, 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 it does talk about a little bit about self-control and about what, as Christians, what we've done. But it's nothing in comparison that we see in the, the answer to it, what Jesus has done for us. I've traveled down a lonely road and no one seemed to care. The burden on my weary back had bowed me to despair. I oft complained to Jesus how folks were treating me. And then I heard him say so tenderly, My feet were all so weary upon the Calvary road. The cross became so heavy, I fell beneath the load. Be faithful, weary pilgrim. Lift your cross and follow close to me. I work so hard for Jesus, I often boast and say. I've sacrificed a lot of things to walk the narrow way. I gave up fame and fortune, I'm worth a lot to thee. And then I hear him gently say to me, I left the throne of glory and counted it by loss. My hands were nailed in anger upon a cruel cross. But now we'll make the journey with your hands safe in mine. So lift your cross and follow close to me. Oh Jesus, if I die upon a foreign field someday, t'would be no more than love demands, no less could I repay. No greater love hath mortal man than for a friend to die. These are the words he gently spoke to me. It's just a cup of water I place within your hand. Then just a cup of water is all that I demand. But if by death I live ye, they can thy glory see. I'll take my cross and follow close to thee. Our next song is, Oh, to be like thee. Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all earth's treasures, Jesus thy perfect likeness to wear. Sweet. 
we read a, pro a comment by the prophet condemning the people of Israel for failing to offer the sacrifices not for failing to offer the sacrifices, but for offering the sacrifices without the proper heart. Let's read verses 6 through 8. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to the new priests who despise my name? Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar. But you say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? Malachi is talking about you know, the attitude of the heart. Uh, God's commanded throughout the Old Testament, they were commanded to make sacrifices to God. But Psalms 50, 10 through 12, tells us that God did not need the sacrifices that they offered. Verses 10 through 12 of chapter 50. <clears throat> For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving. Psalms is telling us that it was not for God's benefit that the sacrifices were required. God didn't need the sacrifices for himself. The sacrifices were ordered by God for the people. They were offered to, as a purpose, they had a purpose in offering them. David in Psalms 116 knew what God wanted. He starts in verse 12 and 13 and he says, What shall I render to the Lord? for all the goodness he has given me. I will offer to him the blessings of my salvation and call upon him in prayer and keep the promises that I have made to him. And in verse 17 he says, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Now, he says that back in, verse, in chapter 50 as well, that God wants our thanksgiving not the physical sacrifices. That's not what God was really after. He commanded them to offer those animals and to, and to remember and to, and to perform those sacrifices, some on a daily basis. But he wanted their hearts. He wanted them to have the proper attitude. In Psalms 50, verse 23, God tells us that whatever offers praise glorifies God, glorifies me. The praise that we offer, the praise that they offered under the old law was the sacrifices. But they had to do it with a proper heart. The sacrifices of the animals were to remind them what God had done for them. And what God would do for them. It was to remind them of the promises that God had made and fulfilled. And the promises that God had made and will fulfill. He did, God did not want them to forget the blessings that he had provided already and what he would continue to provide. When we think about the partaking of the Lord's Supper, its purpose is very similar to the sacrifices under the old law. Partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine is not for God. He doesn't need that. He's not going to forget what happened on that on that. Passover day, the death and the burial and the resurrection of his son. But we do need to be remembered. 1 Corinthians 11, 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. This memorial that we're about to partake of is to remind us that God gave his son as a sacrifice for our sins. My sins, your sins. 
that Christ loved us so much that he was willing to die to give his life as a sacrifice for our sins. It's to help us remember that he suffered and died a horrible, painful, public death for you and me. That he was raised from the dead as the first fruit of our resurrection. Fulfillment of prophecy that had been been proclaimed and presented over 4,000 years before the act that took place of Christ's death. God fulfilled those prophecies. That's what we're supposed to remember. We're supposed to remember what that death and that resurrection means to us. <coughs> the Lord's Supper is for you and it's for me that we not forget what Christ and God did for each one of us. And further, what not to forget what his death means to us in the future. The forgiveness of our sins and the promise that was made of an eternity in heaven with God and his son. Gary made reference to that in his prayer this morning. And it's, it's a very great truth that we need to constantly never forget, that we should never forget God's promise to us that we have an eternity in heaven with him. We're just <coughs> visitors here on this earth right now, he says. We're just pilgrims. He wants us to be looking for that home in heaven. And our partaking of the Lord's Supper is to never let us forget the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ and what it means to us as Christians. Let's pass out the bread. Thanks for the bread. Father in heaven, we come unto you at this time thanking you for this emblem, the bread that we are about to partake of. It represents the body of Christ that was destroyed on that cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Help us, Father, to constantly remember that that sacrifice was for each and every one of us and what it means to us as Christians. In his name we pray. Give thanks for the cup. Father in heaven, we thank you for the death of your son, that by the shedding of his blood, we have the new covenant, we have a promise of eternal life. We thank you, Father, for this cup that represents that blood, and we pray that we'll never forget what that sacrifice means to each one of us. In his name we pray, amen.
But we need to really sit and contemplate all of those physical blessings that we have, that we that we truly are blessed by God, and we don't, and we need to remember that. We may not have the happiest life that we that we possibly can could have, but God knows what He's doing, and He knows the blessings that He's given to each one of us, and that we can we can live with those blessings, and and we are to use those blessings to further His glory and to further His name on this earth. You know, it you think about. Sometimes just sit sometime and think about what it would be like in this world today if God had not given his son to die on the cross. What condition this world would have been? You know, we look at the Old Testament, we see a number of occasions where it, it says that they, they forgot God, they ignored God, and they did what they wanted to do. And you can think, you know, how this world would be if everyone had that same kind of an attitude. So we, we are truly blessed by God in many, many ways. So we need to remember that. Let's give thanks for our blessings. Our Father in heaven, we come unto you at this time, especially thanking you for the physical blessings that you've given us in this beautiful world that you've provided for us. We thank you, Father, for those blessings, and we pray that we will use those blessings in our daily lives in a way to bring glory to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
that last song is like dead on point. <laughs> All right. Good morning. It's good to be here with you today to, uh, to be here on what is a beautiful day as far as I'm concerned here in Basin. It's, uh, it's warming up some, but coming from the valley, it's, as I said, it's already warmer in the valley right now than it's going to be at any point up here pretty much throughout the summer, and, and that makes me a very happy camper. So. <laughs> we are finishing a series today. Now we started, I don't really want to tell you how long ago we started, it is a while back, um, but we're starting, we're finishing a series on the divine nature that we started, where we're looking at 2 Peter chapter 2, verses uh, 2, or, sorry, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, and Peter says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our, our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So we've been looking at the divine nature in, in the sense of trying to understand God's nature better. Because if we're going to be partakers in that nature, then we should reasonably think that we ought to know something about that nature, what to expect, what we're looking for. And in fact, the scriptures give us lots of clues about this, and probably one of the best ones is over in Galatians chapter 5, where it talks about what the Spirit of the Lord is producing in us as it lives in us, as the Holy Spirit indwells us. Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So as we've gone through this passage and looked at it, rather than going through and saying, okay, how do we show love? How do we show joy? How do we uh, have gentleness? What we've been looking at is how does God exhibit these characteristics? And the last of those characteristics is self-control. And I'll be honest with you, this is the most challenging one. This was the most challenging one to write a sermon about. Because it's easy to talk about self-control for us, because it's easy to pick out all the things that we don't do very well when it comes to self-control. As Mark said, I, I love the, the, the phrase, sometimes the things we do aren't the right things to do. And, and so it's easy for us to pick that out. But when we talk about God, the opposite is true. God never does the wrong. And so as we look at the divine nature and we look at God's self-control, we're going to look at some specific areas in which he does exhibit control that maybe we don't always think about. It. We're, there, there are areas that we do think about in some respects, but I want to try to give us a little bit of a different, different perspective on those things. I want to start, though, by a passage over in uh, Exodus, chapter 20, uh, Exodus chapter 33. rather. Moses has gone up on Mount Sinai. He is there in front of the Lord. He's been spending a lot of time up there on Sinai coming up and down and different things like that. The Lord has given him the Ten Commandments, but Moses has only just been uh, ordered to, to put them onto stone tablets. And, and, and in, in the course of this, God is talking, or, sorry, Moses is talking to God and imploring God to come with the Israelites and to continue to have that physical presence there of the pillar of, cl of, uh, of cloud and the pillar of smoke and the pillar of fire that he's been having all that way along because Moses basically is saying, look, Number one, we're not going to make it if you don't do it. And number two, I'm going to kill all of them if you don't, if you don't come along. Um, and so, so God is, is, is talking about this with Moses and that he is going to be their God. And then Moses asks something of God. He says, I pray you, show me your glory. I don't know if this is a brave thing to ask or a stupid thing to ask. Because that's not the sort of thing that I would have ever thought to ask of God in that situation. But Moses wants to see God's glory. And God responds to him and says, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. Notice that Moses, God has already told Moses what his name is. We talked about that before. It's that YHVH that we translate as Jehovah or Yahweh. But God says, I'm going to go in front of you. I'm going to show you how good I am, how powerful I am, and I'm going to proclaim my name before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. God continues and says, Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. That's the line from the song we sing sometimes. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. 
So Moses, it says, he rose up early in the morning and he went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. By the way, and the, God also says to him, uh, come up by yourself. Don't have anybody else on the mountain, which was unusual because Joshua had been going partway up the mountain with him. He says, don't even let any animals graze at the foot of the mountain. It's just you and me. But he goes up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. He took the two, two stone half tablets in his hand. And it says, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. So Moses is calling out to God, and God is there in a cloud so that Moses cannot see him. And then it says, the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed these words. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands and forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren of the third and fourth generations. As I was thinking about this lesson, I came across this passage and it struck me that almost nothing better expresses the kind of control and power that God does than when he passes in front of Moses there and proclaims his name and his goodness and what he is and, and shows all of that. By the way, the result of this is that Moses' face lights up like a, like a flashlight and he, he's glowing when he comes down from the mountain. But my favorite part of this actually is, the, is Moses' reaction because it says all this and then it says, Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. He made haste. He didn't just gradually do it. He hit the floor, basically. And I think that's fantastic because the, the, man, the man Moses, as, as, as humble and as righteous a man pretty much as has ever lived outside of Christ himself, immediately understands that this is a seminal moment in his life and in the existence of the Israelites, that he is being shown God in a way that nobody has been shown God since Adam, probably, Adam and Eve, and that he is experiencing this relationship in a way that most of us will never experience in this life, although in some ways we experience an even better relationship. But, but not that kind of direct, he can see God kind of a thing, and having God actually call out his name in front of Moses and, and tell him who he is. And so what I want us to understand as we go into this is that God is in complete control of everything. That is his nature. He is the Lord, and the, no, the, nation of, the notion of his name, the Lord, is that idea of infinite power and authority. So when we talk about self-control when it comes to God, in some respects it's kind of silly to talk about it, although I'm going to talk about it for about half an hour, so here we go. But, but it's, it's kind of silly on one hand, but it's important to realize that, that God's control of himself and of his power is not like ours. It's not like the way that we do things. And like I said, as Mark said, sometimes we do things we ought not to do or that we don't even want to do. That doesn't happen to God. So let's take a look at a couple of or three different areas about this. And the first one I want us to understand is that God is in total control of his power and of everything that he's created with his power. Over in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible begins by saying, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and the darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And then God said, let there be light, and there was light. The profound nature of this is sometimes lost on us because it's easy to go through and just read it and think about it in terms of, I've got to try to remember what happened on each day, and, and all these different things that got created and everything else, but the, the nature of God being able to simply say, speak, and things come into existence, things take place, is utterly unlike the operation of human power. We have to do things, and even if I were, you know, some important person speaks and somebody else does it, somebody else has to do it. There's this, you know, there's this, there's this, this effort, there's this labor. In God's case, God speaks and things happen because that is the nature of his power. He is in complete control of his power. And, and, and that is... As I mentioned, it's unlike the human experience. For humans, sometimes the things that we do don't work out the way we want them to when it comes to our power. Probably the single greatest power that humans have unlocked, with the, maybe the exception of genetic power over the last few years, but in the, in the last 50 or 60 years is the, is the power of the, the atom, the nuclear bomb, nuclear, nuclear power, stuff like that. So far, most of the nuclear bombs that we've set off have done exactly what we wanted. It's actually one that was set off where they miscalculated some, um, 
some of the elements and bomb was like five times as powerful as they expected and ended up destroying several atolls that they had intended to just have measurements taken from. So it doesn't always work out exactly the way we want. But one of the most stark examples of human power going astray is Chernobyl. This is Chernobyl um, actually a number of years after the nuclear reactor meltdown that happened in the 80s. That big um, dome or, or um, arcing thing that you see in the back there is not a normal feature of most nuclear reactors. It had to be built to cover over the reactors themselves, the actual reactors of Chernobyl, because they were continuing to leak radiation decades after the actual incident happened. And that was the only way they could begin to protect not just the immediate environment, but long term, the whole area of the Ukraine. This is what happens when human power doesn't get used quite the right way. It doesn't, doesn't go quite the right way when we're not totally in control of it. And you think, well, that's, that's a problem for a very unique situation. But think about how many of you have been at some point or another in a car wreck. Now, I'm not saying it's your fault necessarily, I'm just saying you've been in one. Definition, a car wreck is an example of human power that got out of control. Nobody get well, I shouldn't say nobody, but almost nobody gets into the car and goes, you know, I think I'm going to run into something. There, there might be a few people who've had some really weird days, but for the most part, we don't get into a car and say we're going to run into something today. But it, nevertheless, statistically speaking, it is a, an American who drives a car for their, most of their adult life is inevitably going to get into a car wreck. In fact, if you're just a passenger in a car for most of your adult, car, your adult life, you're going to get into a car wreck. In America today, it is statistically extremely unlikely that you will live your entire life and not be in at least some kind of a little fender bender or something like that. Whether it's your fault or not, that happens because human power is not fully under our control. And that's just our limited finite power. Isn't it a good thing that God's power is, in fact, fully under his control? Because he has infinite power. We've talked about this before. And you think about some of the ways that God exhibits his power in, in, the, in the scriptures. And creation is the most extreme version. But what we see when God incarnate comes to earth, Jesus, he exhibits his power over creation in a number of different ways. And probably one of the best stories is over in Matthew chapter 8 when it says Jesus got into a boat. His disciples followed him. And behold, as they were going across the lake, a great storm arose on the sea so that the boat was being covered with the waves. That's a bad situation. When the waves are coming over the boat, you know you're in trouble. But Jesus himself was asleep, and they came to him and woke him and said, Save us, Lord. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? And he got up and rebuked the winds of the seas, and they became perfectly calm. The men were amazed and said, What kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? This isn't even... God the Father creating from, you know, the voice at the beginning. So this is Jesus, the incarnate God, who is able to speak the word to the winds and the waves and calm them because he has power over creation. God's power over creation is not just unlimited. It is also exacting. He controls it. He doesn't just set it loose and let it go and have no control over it. And the scope of this should not escape us. It's not just that God, like I said, set things in motion or that he occasionally intervenes. There is an ongoing process that shows that God is in control of the power that he has and of the creation that he's used that power to, to make. Over in Acts chapter 17, we actually looked at this passage very early in this series. Paul, speaking to the Athenians, says, The God who made the world and all the things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with human hands. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And so right off the bat, Paul is saying God made the world, so he's got that power. He made everything in it, he's got that power. He doesn't need anything from us. He's not, you know, he doesn't need replenishment or, you know, you know, assistance or even worship from us. But instead, he gives life and breath and all things to the people that live on this earth. So he says everything comes from God, and God is the one who made all of it. Then he goes on and he says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitations. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. He starts off and he's basically saying the same thing. He made... Basically, everybody that lives on the earth, he made them come from one man. And he decides where they're going to live and how long they're going to survive. But notice that last part there. In him we live and move and exist. In another 
translation that says live and move and have our being. God's control over creation, over his power, isn't just something, like I said, we set it in motion and occasionally intervenes. Rather, his control is an ongoing thing. Reality exists and continues to exist because of him. Paul says about Christ that Christ holds all things together. The universe doesn't just exist because God created it. The universe exists because God sustains it. And in doing that, he exercises perfect control. God doesn't do anything by accident. He, whoops, I made a platypus. No, there was some reason why he made that. I can't figure out what it is, but there's some reason why he made that. He doesn't do anything by accident. He doesn't do too much. He doesn't do too little. He's kind of like, I guess, what is it, the, 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 the third of the bowls of porridge that, that Goldilocks finds. Or, you know, it's just right. He always does it exactly right. He doesn't make mistakes with that. And so God is in perfect control of his power. The second thing we need to understand is that God is perfectly in control of his plans, of the ideas that he has, of what he wants to do. God is the only being in all of creation that always follows through on what he plans to do. A lot of this stems from things we've looked at before, that he has that eternal nature, that he is the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It actually says this over in Malachi chapter 3, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. God doesn't change, and because of that, he, when he makes plans, he's not going to change his mind later, but more importantly, he's already there in that time when that plan comes to fruition, so he knows it's going to work, and he knows what he has to do to make it work in the meantime. And here again, when we think about ourselves, we're not so good at this. And it's not even always our fault. Over in Ecclesiastes, Solomon says this, I hated all the fruit of my labor, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. Not that he necessarily dislikes the man who will come after me, but he says, who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. I might have an idiot for a son. And it turned out he was right about that. He did have an idiot for a son. Yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor, for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. Solomon says, even if I do everything right, even if I make all the right choices and leave everything in, in a perfect condition to my heir, who knows what he's going to do with it? Who knows whether he's going to be an idiot or whether he's going to use it well? Who knows if it's going to turn out to be something that's beneficial to him and to other people or whether he's going to waste it? And of course we know, as I said, that it's not ironic, it's, it's a little sad, that the son of Solomon was Rehoboam, who lost the northern two-thirds of the kingdom because he was foolish about how he responded when people asked him to back off on the taxes and the hard work. And so sometimes we can't control what our plans are simply because we're going to die at some point. We're going to have to move on and somebody else is going to take over. Think about how many, how many nations have planned things and then a new government has come in and those plans just went away. I mean, that happens all the time in this country. Um, and, 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 but the, and of course, then that, the, not that even gets to the, the reality that most of the time the problem isn't somebody else that comes after us, the problem is us. We're terrible at following through with things. Things get difficult, we say, you know what, I don't want to do that. Um, this, is, this is just too much work for me. Um, we make plans and, and, you know, things go wrong or things get complicated or whatever or something else comes along and we dump the plan we had and we go on to something else because that's our nature. We are not just finite, but we are also sort of fickle when it comes to making decisions. And so even the most important plans that we have, a lot of times we do a poor job of following through on those. But God never fails to follow through. God always carries out his plans. Psalm 33 says, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Notice, he spoke and it happens. He completes his tasks. And the things that he do, does, they stand fast. They last. They don't just fade away the way that so many human accomplishments do. The psalmist goes on and says, the Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. In other words, Nations make plans, and God just does whatever he wants to, and a lot of times the nation's plans just go right away. He frustrates the plans of the peoples, but the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans are his heart from generation to generation. God's planning and his carrying out of his plans is an eternal thing. It always happens. He's always in control of those plans. In Isaiah chapter 48, God says, I foretold the former things long ago. He's talking about prophecies. My mouth announced them and I made them known. And then suddenly I acted and they came to pass. 
God doesn't forget about the things that he plans either. Sometimes we forget stuff. I mean, I have personally had this happen because I don't have any kids, but how many of you have forgotten to pick up one of your kids at something? You don't have to raise your hands for that. <laughs> How many of you have forgotten an appointment or forgotten something you were supposed to do? I forgot until last night that I was supposed to write up a, a lesson uh, sheet for our class this morning. And so we forget things. And, and in my case, I was able to get it done and bring it here. But a lot of times we forget things to the point where we can't fix it. We can't go back and do it. God doesn't ever forget his promises. His prophecies, no matter how long ago they are, he still carries them out exactly when they're supposed to be carried out. So it's not just that he, he, he always carries out his promises, that he's in control of his plans. It's that they happen exactly when he wants them to. He carries them out exactly at the right time as well. And then the final thing I want us to look at is this idea that God is in complete control of how he reacts or responds, of, of how he uses his knowledge and wisdom and power. God is the ultimate first responder. We use that term often to, respond, to, to uh, reference policemen and, and firemen who are called to the scene of something that's gone terribly wrong. Be, I, I, don't, I mean, Mark, Mark, you know what this is like, but it's kind of an odd thing to imagine that, that every phone call you get as a police officer or a fireman generally means that something has gone wrong, you know? And maybe as a police officer, you get to patrol around and kind of look for things to fix before they go wrong. But in general, the only thing, the only time people call you is when something has gone terribly wrong. And, and these people go out there, and their job is to respond correctly to the situation. And one of the unfortunate things that we've been seeing in our, in our society in recent years especially is that some of our police officers are not responding real well to some of the situations that they're encountering. And that gets us back to the human problem. But when we talk about God... Corinthians says the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. God does not have the limitations of intelligence and wisdom that we do. He doesn't have the limitations of weakness that we do. He is infinitely wise and infinitely strong, and because of that, his responses to those crises, his, his the use of those powers is always correct. And it's not just that his power or his wisdom is greater than ours. It's fundamentally different in nature because it gets into that area that we really, I can't really find the words to exactly explain it, and we don't really have the capacity to understand it. That's part of the problem, fundamentally. God's wisdom is infinite, where ours, our wisdom is terribly finite. And his power is infinite, where our power is so little. And, and his knowledge and his understanding, all these things, they're infinite and they're eternal. And because of that, they're of a totally different type and kind than ours is. We gradually discover little bits and pieces of things, and a lot of times we have to go back and revise what we thought we knew time after time. God knows everything right off the bat. He understands everything right off the bat, and because of that, it's, there's this fundamental difference between his way of doing things and our way of doing things, and, and that takes us back to the problems as humans that we have, especially when we're confronted with situations that are unexpected or unwelcome. The proverb writer says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Well, I mean, is there anybody in here who can honestly raise their hand and say, I have never responded badly to something negative? I'd like to meet you. I have doubts that you exist, but I'd like to meet you. Also, the proverb writer says, the tongue of the wise makes knowledge good, but the mouth of fools spouts folly. I love this one. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge sound like a good thing. It makes it acceptable. It makes it pleasant. The mouth of an idiot spouts out whatever, you know, whatever stupidity comes along. When you think about our responses, we, we struggle in, in two major areas. We struggle in how we respond in terms of our tone, in terms of our harshness. We also struggle with the wisdom of what we say and the knowledge that we have. There's a lot of, a lot of different... Uh, phrases or, or, um, or pieces of advice about this, you know, that talk about, you know, better to keep your mouth closed and be thought a fool and open it and remove all doubt and that kind of thing, you know. Um, but it's, it's kind of our, our nature. We, 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 we're, we like to talk and sometimes we talk when we should keep our mouths shut. And finally, the proverb writer says, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger calms a dispute. See, the consequence of our behavior of our reactions is problematic a lot of times. When we react poorly, when we don't give, when we don't have control over ourselves or over our tongues, that's why I thought that was such a great song, we stir up strife, we cause dissension, we create disunity and disharmony. If we can be slow to anger, if we can, we can put a cap on that, then we can help to calm things down. One of the things that I've learned 
um, as, a, as a lawyer, I learned it as a lawyer, I've continued to practice it as a, as, a, as a preacher, is that when you read something online and you feel like you need to post a comment or when somebody sends you an email and you feel like you need to send an email back that's, that's harsh or abrasive or whatever, write your email but don't send it. Write your comment but don't post it. And let it sit for a while and think about it. A lot of times sleep on it. That's what I normally do unless it's something urgent. I'll sleep on it. And then, send, and then before you actually send your answer, go back and reread it. And more often than not, when I do that, I go back and find there are some significant ways I, in which I should edit, whatever it was I was going to say. You know, some significant things I should not say that, that, would, that would cause unnecessary problems, that would make things harder. But it's not easy to have that mindset, and it's especially hard to have that when somebody said something to us in person. Man, when somebody says something to you in person and it's insulting or it's harsh or it's, it's cruel or mean, it is hard not to have that blood boil up and just answer right back, you know? And, and, and it's amazing how much damage you can do and how much damage we can do when we do that because we're not really in control of how we react to things. And it's more than that. Jesus talks about, you know, turn the other cheek when somebody strikes you on one cheek. That's not exactly a normal reaction for us, you know? There's a lot of things like that where, where the way that we react is really not under our control because we don't put it under our control. We choose not to have or have not to have learned that kind of control. But God never does that. God never, and a part of that is because he knows what's going to happen. So I guess that would help, you know. If somebody told you three days ahead of time that somebody was going to yell at you tomorrow, you'd probably have some time to think about, you know, a good reaction to that. So some of that is God knowing it, but more fundamentally, it's that God's character and nature is one where his wisdom and his self-control allow him to make the right response in all situations. In a very similar passage to some of what we looked at earlier where God is proclaiming his nature to Moses, in Numbers chapter 14, Moses says, The Lord is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations. What he's saying is that God responds correctly in all situations. That in, in situations where someone deserves or, or, or has, where God sees that, the right, the, the, that mercy is the right response, that's what they get. And in situations where justice is required and judgment is required, that's what God does. But in all those situations, he does the right thing. And he waits, and he forgives, and he is patient for as long as he can be. So God has perfect timing as well. So over in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter talks about this timing. He says, first of all, know this, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is this promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. I think it's funny, Peter wrote this 40 years after Christ left. We're 2,000 years later, and we're still, you know, it's good that he wrote that, because I think a lot of people would feel increasingly emboldened after another 2,000 years to think that maybe that's the case. But Peter continues on and says, Do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God's responses, his reactions to humanity. Remember, humanity is, in, in one sense, it, it literally it is a constant ongoing offense to God that we exist and do the things that we do. That's kind of a harsh way to put it, but it's true. And I can back that up because I can, I can show you over in uh, Leviticus when it talks about the daily sacrifice that the Israelites were required to offer, a lamb in the morning, a lamb in the evening. That literally, that God says that sacrifice, literally, that's just there so that I don't wipe out the humans off the face of the earth. You're doing that to appease me because of all the other offensive things that you do all the time. So we are an offense to God, and, and our sin is necessarily inherently an offense to God because it's a rebellion against him. And despite that, God is patient with us. Despite that, God is slow to anger. Where for most of us, I mean, imagine if everything around you offended you and frustrated you and upset you all the time. How long would you go before you started breaking stuff? You know, how long would you go before you started screaming and yelling? The reality is that God's patience and his timing, his sense of when is the right time to do these things, 
is so far beyond our ability to understand it that there's really no explaining it. God is not infinitely patient, but where our patience is tremendously finite, his patience is exactly the right amount of patience because he's in control of the way that he responds to humanity and the way that he reacts to humanity. But with that said, like Peter says, don't let the fact of judgment escape your notice. The reality is that, that, that God who has perfect control of his power and perfect control of his plans and perfect control of how he responds to us, and he's made it clear that there's going to come a day when that power and that plan and that judgment is all going to come to pass and that those who are waiting for it will see it carried out. And those who deserve judgment and are, are waiting or, could, or they're destined for condemnation, they're going to be judged and they're going to be sent away. But the cool thing is that those of us who have been given mercy are going to experience something that nobody's ever experienced before. And that is recreation. I don't mean recreation like you went to the park and walked your dog. Mm -hmm. I mean recreation. Paul talks about this in Corinthians as our bodies being resurrected and raised in perfection. Unlike the failed and, and flawed bodies we have, the Revelation writer talks about a new heaven and a new earth that are perfect. But then the Revelation writer, John, says this. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is fascinating because he says that now God is going to dwell with people. Remember what Moses had. He couldn't even see God's face because to see God's face was to die. But now God's going to be dwelling with us. So that problem is going to be fixed. But the Revelation writer continues. John says, he who sits on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, right, for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. Remember what we looked at. The beginning of all this is God bringing into existence the heaven and the earth, calling forth light with his word. And now, at the end of time, John says God is making all things new. He's recreating what was made before, but he's recreating without sin without the possibility of sin, and with only those people in it who are part of that plan. Because God is the Alpha, the beginning, and the Omega, the end, and this is the end. And he says, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without, without cost. We will live forever with God. And then lastly, God says, he who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. The control of God is significant because the thing is, as Peter says, there are going to be people who are going to say, you know what, God really isn't in control. You know what, all this stuff has been happening, nothing has changed, God doesn't exist, or God just set everything in motion and he just forgot about us, he's just moved on. But the scriptures make it clear to us that God is in control, that he does have a plan, and that he is using his awesome, infinite power to bring that plan to fruition. And when that plan comes to fruition, those who are his beloved, those who have been willing to access the mercy that he freely offers through Christ, they're going to live with him forever in perfect bodies, bodies that don't wear out, break down and everything else, and in perfect homes, in perfect cities, in the new Jerusalem with God. That's what we're looking forward to. So the message I want to leave you with, not just for today, but also for this overall story that we've been looking at, this big picture series that we've been doing, is to make you understand that we're looking at this because we do have a God who is in total control of the world. And yeah, he lets a lot of things happen. He allows a lot of things to happen that he probably doesn't care for too much, that he doesn't want to even happen to his children. But he allows those things to happen because they are part of that bigger plan that has an eternal purpose. Because we can trust in God's nature, in that divine nature to do what's best for us, and to do it with all the power and all the magnificence that God embodies, we can have faith not just in the future, in eternity, but in what's going to happen tomorrow, 
that it's going to be part of God's plan. So let's live not just like we're waiting for a future to come, salvation that is to come, but let's recognize that every day we live in the grace of God. Every day we live in God's salvation, and every day is a day that's lived in his plan. And let's show that to the world every day. Let's stand and say. <clears throat> Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. In the prayer.